Aids to Devotion by Andrew Murray Chapter 6 The Spirit of Wisdom Ephesians 1 verses 16 and 17 I do not cease to give thanks for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you spiritual wisdom and revelation in your growing knowledge of him. Right after Paul mentioned the Holy Spirit as God's seal on believers, he speaks of his unceasing prayer that God would especially give them the spirit of wisdom. It is not enough that the believer has the Holy Spirit. That Spirit can only do his blessed work as God works through him in answer to prayer. Paul prays unceasingly and with that teaches them to pray unceasingly too for the wisdom of the Spirit to enlighten the eyes of their heart. Just as a child needs education, the believer who has the Spirit within him needs a divine illumination from day to day to know God and the spiritual life he bestows. This life is so supernatural and such a divine mystery that without spiritual wisdom and understanding we cannot comprehend it. Footnote But I thought they had the Spirit already. Yes, certainly, but here is a further gift of the Spirit, a deeper draught. The blessed stream of the Holy Spirit is forever proceeding from the Father and the Son. There is no finality in this work. It is not like Christ's work, a finished work. Observe that there is no expression in Scripture which limits the power or the measure of the outgoing of the Holy Spirit. There is no word to say that the Spirit of God is come to an individual or a church and that therefore the door may be shut because there is no more Spirit of God to come. We are to be ever receiving and ever expending and yet ever expecting at the same time. We must be forevermore opening our hearts to receive further gifts and provisions, forever letting in great waves of the Spirit to pour through our life. May our God flood us all afresh with fuller waves of truth and love and power. From the Spiritual Grasp of the Epistles by the Rev. C. A. Fox We need to know three things. First, what the hope of His calling is, the high and holy and heavenly calling of which we are to walk worthily, then the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints, what the unsearchable riches are of the heavenly treasure which God has in his saints, and lastly, and very specially, we need to know the power by which we can fulfill our calling and possess our heritage, the incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe. The life the Christian has to live here on earth is so truly the life of God in the soul that there is nothing we can do to maintain that life or renew it. It is a life that we have in Christ. It is a life to be received out of Christ by faith daily and hourly. It is a life which only the omnipotence of God himself can begin and carry on. And the great need of the believer is to wait upon God for the Holy Spirit to show the incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe. No human mind can grasp it. The Holy Spirit living in the heart reveals it and teaches us to believe it and to expect it. As Christians, we need to know that we are to depend every day upon God to work in us according to the exceeding greatness of his strength in us who believe. And every day we need to accept the Holy Spirit's teaching in answer to prayer to keep us conscious of this mighty power working in us. Footnote The Spirit was needed to give a fuller knowledge of God himself. The Greek words used are especially significant, implying intimate spiritual understanding. Then follow three great things into which a spiritual insight is needed for the full Christian life. 1. What is the hope of his calling, the knowledge of what the hope was which God held out to them when he called them? In Ephesians 1 verse 4, Paul said, For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight in love. What light shines upon these words when the Holy Spirit shows us what possibilities they imply, and how God himself will make them true in us, so as to fit us to be holy to him for his service on earth in love to all. 2. What are the riches of the glory of this inheritance in the saints? There is a twofold inheritance. We are God's heritage. Of this we read in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. 
and God is our heritage. Of this we read in verse 14, Who is the down payment of our inheritance? The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, which the Holy Spirit is to reveal, includes both. The words in Colossians 1 verse 27 show us that this means nothing less than Christ in us, the glorious riches of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is God's treasure, dwelling in our heart with all his unsearchable riches. 3. The incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe, as displayed in the exercise of his immense strength. This power he exercised in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This remains an enigma, a mystery, until the Holy Spirit reveals it by renewing us in the spirit of our mind to see, to desire, and to believe it. These three great spiritual blessings constitute the sum of what a believer needs to know and needs of the Holy Spirit to teach him. A sight, first of all, of all that God wants him to be, then a consciousness of the wonderful riches and glory of this inheritance in the saints, nothing less than Christ in them, and then the living assurance that the almighty power of Christ's resurrection life is actually and unceasingly working in them to fit them for all that they are to be and to do for God. Would God that his children believed in the glory of this mystery and in the power with which it would work in them, would God that his children learn to wait for the spirit of divine wisdom to reveal it to them? With regard to this mighty power dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit shows us its work and nature. It is the power of God, as displayed in the exercise of his immense strength. This power he exercised in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. It is this power that works in us who believe to raise us up from a life under the power of death to a life in the glory of heaven. It is by the incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe that our daily life has to be lived in fellowship with the life of the Son of God. God raised Christ from the dead because his death on the cross had exhibited the deepest humility and the most perfect obedience. Because he had yielded himself unreservedly to the power of God, both in his life and suffering and in his surrender to death and the grave, God raised him from the dead and gave him glory. And in the same way, when we give ourselves over to die with Christ to sin and to the world and to the flesh, in a Christ-like humility and obedience, the incomparable greatness of his power will work in us to make us partakers day by day, of the resurrection power and of the spirit of glory which followed it. This thought of the life of the believer as being the exhibition of the exceeding greatness of God's power in us who believe runs through all the writings of Paul. In his prayer for the Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 10, he asked that they may live worthily of the Lord and please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good deed, growing in the knowledge of God. And then he adds, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the display of all patience and steadfastness, joyfully giving thanks. As one thinks of the life of devotion which Paul here sets before us, always worthy of God and pleasing to him, always fruitful in every good work, always increasing in the living knowledge of God, and always persevering with all patience and long-suffering, one feels that the standard is an impossible one. But then a thought comes in, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And we say, no, if this is true, if God works this, the life is possible. Here, in this epistle, the same thought occurs. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 now to him who by the power that is working within us is able to do far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations for ever and ever. The words lift our heart to believe and expect something far beyond what we ask or think. The life we are to live is to be a supernatural one. It is to be the resurrection life. 
yes more, the heavenly life of Christ in glory, maintained in us by the same working of the strength of his might, by which he raised Christ from the cross to the throne. The very same almighty power, by which Christ rose from the dead as the conqueror of sin and death, is the power that works in our hearts, to give us too the victory over every sin. To believe this with our whole heart will at once bring us to a sense of our utter impotence, but also of the divine certainty that God will fulfill his purpose in us. If the believer will but trust the exceeding greatness of his power, will but yield himself in entire subjection to let that power rule in his heart and do all its will there, if he will be content, amid perfect ignorance and impotence, to trust the strength that is made perfect in weakness, if he will but count all things loss for the sake of this blessed prize, then God's word pledges that the power that raised Christ shall work in him day by day, until he shall know what it is here to live and reign with Christ in glory. We are trying to discover what the New Testament standard of a life of true devotion is, and whether the accepted standard of our modern Christianity is in harmony with it. Let us try to sum up in our own mind the full meaning of Paul's prayer. Think of his private devotions pleading for his Ephesians. Think of what the standard of his own life must have been as he speaks so often of God's working in him. Colossians 1 verse 29, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 10, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, chapter 4 verse 7, chapter 12 verse 9 and 10, Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Think of what he wished his readers to take as their aim and expectation. Think of how his whole soul was set upon the two great thoughts, every believer to live every day under the teaching of the Holy Spirit and under the mighty power of God working in him. And then pause and ask whether your secret devotion and your confident faith and your hope in daily life have consented to accept and rejoice in the life that is held out to us here, daily to live out the exceeding greatness of God's power working in you and daily to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit to remain dependent on that power. Footnote. The lessons of this passage for those who are in the ministry or have charge of souls are simply invaluable. They point to the three great spiritual blessings that include all that a Christian needs to know of what God has prepared for him. They remind us that to preach these truths to believers is not sufficient. Human wisdom cannot grasp them. If the knowledge is to be vital and effectual, it needs a special illumination of the Holy Spirit, making us spiritual men. It is only the spiritual man who can discover spiritual things. It is God himself, the Father of glory, who can and will give us the spirit of wisdom in answer to definite and persevering prayer. It is the teacher who has learned all this for himself and seeks to bring it home to others, on whom the duty especially devolves of unceasing prayer that God would bestow the gift of the Spirit of Wisdom on all to whom the teaching comes. Such teaching and such praying will lead believers to the full life which the Epistle sets before them. Let all ministers of the Gospel study and pray this prayer until every thought of preaching or teaching, of the needs of individuals or of all God's children together, is ever borne upward with the supplication Father of glory, give your children the spirit of wisdom in divine revelation in the knowledge of you and of all you are prepared to work in them. May God help us to return again and again to this passage until it becomes to us, through the Holy Spirit, the very light of God shining in our heart and the power of God working in our life. <laughs>